The academic agent in this latest video aims to look at both the Faustian man and himself in an attempt to understand authenticity. He brought up a number of interesting points, explaining the story of Dr. Faustus and his own problems with connecting with transcendental truths due to what he calls his Faustian nature. Now, I have two problems with his analysis. Firstly, his claim that he is a Faustian man at all, and secondly, in his claim that we can achieve understanding of these transcendental truths non empirically. The first thing that stood out to me that he was attempting to claim that his sorry generation, the cursed Xenial, is an archetype of Faustian man. Now, this is far from the truth. The Faustian man is one that has, by its conception, tried to reach for the infinite. They are the people willing to sell all in their quest to discover transcendental truths. It is no surprise when we look at the fruits of the Faustian labour, we see works of art that are truly unmatched in the world. The cursed Xenial has no will. They exist to critique. They scoff. They deconstruct. They do not build, no, not even build badly. They question and shrug at the world. They do not have a Faustian mindset, but a Socratic one, and I mean that in the worst sense. Imagine for a second, A.A. is the historical king Charlemagne, the man through his Faustian nature bent Europe to his will, a man through his longing for the expanding into space, created cathedrals and buildings with gables that pointed to the stars themselves. A.A. would see the plans for a mighty cathedral and say, Oh, that's nice. It's just like Castlevania. Can we get some more skulls on it? The Faustian man is a man of want, a man of will. He craves to know the unknown, to categorise and analyse it. Thinking back to the play and asking ourselves what part would AA play, it would not be Faustus or even Mistopheles, but simply just someone in the crowd with a phone, taking photos and tweeting about it. Turning to the second point, there is a deeper level of discussion that he brought up. The idea that we can understand these transcendental points through a non-empirical understanding of the world. For this analysis, he brings up the thought experiment of Plato's cave. Plato's cave is a very simple way of showing the problem with reality and understanding. I won't go through the full analogy again, but the long and the short of it is that there are two states of being, chained and free, and that there are two ways of seeing the objects passing by the cave, directly, in the sunlight, or via the shadows. The first thing I want to highlight is that there is a duality of perception in this analogy. There is the individual subjectivity of interpretation, but there is ultimate truth. That is to say, the objects going by the fire have a definite and true form, objectivity. But to each of the cave dwellers, the shadows define the objects differently as it moves closer and further from the fire, warping and changing, subjectivity. Another aspect to this, often not talked about in this analogy, is how the number of dimensions are reduced. The objects walking by are in 3D, while the shadow is always 2D. The cave watchers are limited in their viewing and understanding. Croce, the early 20th century aesthetic philosopher, created a framework for interpreting art in a more complicated, but effectively similar way. There are two halves to the experience of art, the creation process and its experiencing. The art piece begins with the soul and mind of the artist, who, through the means he can, turns those nations and passions into a work of art in a process we call creation. Now, this art piece is then seen by someone, it is experienced, but it also moves someone. Several people can see the same work and be affected in different ways. One person might laugh, the other cry, another experiencing nothing at all. The point is that seeing is different to this affectation, and the affectation is a product of both the intellect and the passions. Plato describes this as the interplay between the animal or thinking soul and the vegetable soul, the soul of passions. Let's create a little thought experiment of our own. This is the famous painting by Titian of Bacchus and Ariadne, one of his most famous works. Imagine that we show this painting to four different people. A bricklayer, a bugman, a classicist, and a gentleman. The first looks upon it and says, it's a pretty painting. I like the trees and the people. They're having some kind of party. What's going on with the snaky boy over there? But in general, he likes it. The bugman looks and feels nothing. It's not very avant-garde, is it? I prefer something that goes against the grain a little. 
this is actually a great example of the male gaze. The classicist looks on it and recognises it immediately. Ah, of course, Bacchus and Ariadne. You can easily recognise the figures here. Ariadne looks to the distance, where Theseus is in his ship. Bacchus, having seen this beauty, is dramatically leaping from his leopard-drawn carriage, which is at the head of a procession of revellers. Very, very interesting. Now the gentleman looks at the painting, and he knows all that the classicist knows, but that's not what interests him. He looks upon the figure of Ariadne, sees the mix of confusion and sadness in her face, and feels for her pain. He looks upon Dionysus, a god-turned-foolish youth, who with one look would recklessly leave his procession, abandoning his duty for the love of a mortal. He knows the passion of Dionysus, for it is the passion of himself, of every man, the suicidal and destructive urge to follow beauty and love whenever we encounter it in our lives. There are four people who see the same object but are moved in different ways due to the state of their being. The bricklayer takes a simple but decent view of the painting, but is ultimately held back by his lack of knowledge of the subject in the story. The bugman feels nothing because he is dead inside. He is more at home with pure abstraction, as this matches his intellect and passions. Chaotic, uncontrolled and simple. The classicist appreciates the work in an intellectual way. He knows the story and likes the depictions, but is not affected by it. While his animal soul can dissect the meaning of the painting masterfully, his understanding ends there. The gentleman is the only one that truly connects with the painting. He combines the intellectual knowledge of the scene with sensibility, allowing him to understand the universal truths in the work. He is the only one that leaves the painting a changed man, profoundly moved. When trying to understand higher truths, intellect is not enough. The classicist had the knowledge but not the chest in the platonic sense, to be moved. Just in the same way, any attempt by AA to live a life of pure intellectual theory will lead him to the same place. Let us return to Plato's cave again, and imagine we know the people watching the shadows on the wall. Their names are Pew, Pew, Bonnie McGrew, Cuthbert, Dibble and Grub. Now these men have been chained for a while. They don't know that the shadows are cast on the wall from a daily procession. At the head of the procession is a double-headed eagle standard made from polished bronze. The procession always causes a stir amongst the men. Much discussion is had as to what the shadows mean or even are. The camp is divided and debate rages back and forth until one day several of the men make a vow and try to work out what the form of the first object in the procession is. Not all of the group wanted to go on this voyage of discovery. Pew II wants nothing to do with this folly. He just tries to ignore the incessant chattering about the form. Pew I, the oldest man there, has suffered greatly from the lack of light. His eyes have cataracts, and even though he wants to help, he can only see blurs of shadows. Barney McGrew declares that he can understand the form without experience, purely intellectually. He closes his eyes and blocks his ears and attempts to conjure it ex nihilo. He spends his days alone and works out in his head that the form is that of a turnip. Cuthbert wants to understand the form, but he points out that everyone's description of the first shadow is different. How can we know what the form is when we can't agree with each other what it looks like? It's all subjective. Dibble agrees, but rebukes him. Yes, we describe something different, but have you noticed there are some parts of the description that are similar? For example, Grub, you said that the form had a nose. Yes, a short nose, and it's on its face. And Cuthbert, you saw that too. Yes, a nose that is curved to a point. We all agree on the nose. We shall call this thing beak. Beak is part of the form. The three men excited by their discovery attempt to see more of the form. Although they are chained, they realise their chains have a little give. Every morning they strain and struggle with the chains in an attempt to get a new insight into the form. Every discovery discussed, debated, hypothesised and tested. One day, a random man rushes into the cave and sets everyone free. Everyone is elated at their freedom and leaves their cave, and they rush outside. The sun hurts their eyes, but they soon adapt to the light. Realising soon that the shadows are due to appear, they decide to wait by the cave. And lo, the procession soon passes outside of the cave, and at the front stands the eagle standard, tall and proud. 
Cuthbert shouts out, Look, see the form's curved nose, and its forefingered hands with long nails. Grub adds, Look, Dibble, I was right, it had two long arms. Barney McGrew sees that the form is not that of a turnip, and declares that this is the wrong procession and storms off. In AA's video, he declares the futility of the situation of understanding transcendent truths, saying that due to the subjectivity of interpretation, there is no point in trying to understand them through observation. He is like Pew the second, who sits in the half-light, waiting to expire. AA declares that when he is out in nature, he is always framing things, reminding him of computer games. This is a fundamental flaw in his being. He is like Pew the first, trying to look, but blind to the shapes on the wall. AA declares that he can understand the forms purely and intellectually, that he is breaking his chains and stepping out into the light. But if breaking the chains can be achieved intellectually, why hasn't anyone in human history achieved this and told the rest of us the truth of the forms? The reality is, those who believe that intellectual endeavour breaks the chains are fools. A Christian understanding of this story is that the chains are broken when we die and are able to gaze upon the face of true beauty, that is, God. AA is like Barney McGrew, cutting himself off from the experience of the shadows and conjuring the forms from the limited capacity of his mind. It is only the truth seekers, the three with a vow to try and find the shape of the form that even comes close to understanding it. Those that pull on the chains of being, stretching and straining, hypothesising and arguing, working together to understand even the smallest parts of the form. With regards to beauty, this is what the canon is, a body of work by great aesthetic minds of many generations, argued over, refined, all trying to find those common points of truth. Now describing AA as a defective may seem harsh, but it's the way that C.S. Lewis describes his situation in The Abolition of Man, which attempts to analyse a similar circumstance. This conception, in all its forms, Platonic, Aristotelian, Stoic, Christian and Oriental alike, I shall henceforth refer to, for brevity's sake, as the Tao. Some of the accounts of it which I have quoted will seem, perhaps, to many of you merely quaint or even magical, but what is common amongst them all is something that we cannot neglect. It is the doctrine of objective value, the behest that certain attitudes are really true, and others really false, to the kind of thing the universe is, and the kind of things we are. Those who know the Tao can hold that to call children delightful or old men venerable is not simply to record a psychological fact about our own parental or filial emotions at the moment, but to recognise a quality which demands a certain response from us, whether we make it or not. I myself do not enjoy the society of small children. Because I speak from within the Tao, I recognise this as a defect in myself, just as a man may have to recognise that he is tone deaf or colour blind. The way that AA describes his generation is completely true. They can never be serious. They are cynical of everything. They have a nomad soul. The Zenil can only be described as a cursed generation, a generation defected from birth. But what is to be done about this generation? Are they eternally lost, destined to roam the land, hollowed soul, with a cynical smile on his lips? The medieval view of the actions of men is derived from the platonic that is, of the vegetable and animal soul. They believe that a man could change how he sees the world, but to do it requires several things. To seek. Just like Pew II had no chance of understanding the forms through his negligence, so to a man who does not seek shall not find. If you wish to discover truth, beauty and goodness, you must be like a runner in the race, with his eyes on the finishing line. Commune. Barney McGrew attempted to generate the form alone and through the mind and failed. We must recognise the defective nature of man. We will never understand truth, beauty or goodness alone and require communion with other seekers. Today, in the forms of groups and communities and seekers of the past in the form of tradition and the canon. Repeat. A man who runs 100 metres once is not an athlete. Nor is a man dragged out by his family on a hike, a seeker of beauty. He is merely a tourist of novelties and moments. A tourist looks to conquer beauty, to capture it in a frame or photo, a memory to last a lifetime. 
but the interaction is shallow and ultimately meaningless. The seeker looks to be conquered by beauty. Discipline and repetition are the watchwords of the seeker, and just as the arm of the javelin thrower grows stronger with every throw, so too will the passions of the seeker grow stronger and stronger, till he can no longer look as a humble stream or waterfall, and not marvel at the beauty of the world. Nature is a painting for us, day after day, pictures of infinite beauty, if only we have the eyes to see them.